um, and we will and we will get to those as well. Um, I think there are some that have been posted on the website, on the BPA website. So, oh, welcome from Switzerland, Botswana. Very nice to see you online. Um, so we have got some questions that were posted before the time, and we will certainly get to those. Um, I see we are on the hour. And uh, so I think if we can just kick off um, and welcome to everybody and uh, welcome especially to, to my guests here today. Um, we're going to be talking about um, well, governance in France. <laughs> and uh, welcome to everybody. And I see we've got some more people just joining now. Um, right. Okay. If I can welcome everybody that's our speakers today. First of all, to welcome Michelle. Michelle is a former CEO of BP Europe, um, former director of CAC 40 companies. Uh, he co-chairs the French Institute of Directors Nomination Committee and is chair of ECODAR's um, policy committee, ECODAR being the European Directors Association. Also welcome today is Carol. Uh, Carol Siro is a former CEO of SNP France, um, of course as the rating agency and former global head of compliance for S&P Global in the US and director of the UN, the United Nations International School and the Dauphine US Foundation and three financial services companies. And today we also have online Andre Jacome, um, who I worked with, had the pleasure of working with in the development of the ISO 37000 standard in, um, in the technical committee at TC309. And Andre is the Chief Executive Officer of BPA. He is an international expert in GRC, Governance, Risk and Compliance, as well as the ESG matters, Environment, Social and Governance. And Sophie, very nice to have you here today. Um, Sophie is a partner, founder and chair of the Think Tank, um, Rules for Growth, I'm not gonna try it in French, <laughs> and member of the ECGI, the European Corporate Governance Institute. So welcome everybody, but I'd like to first of all ask Carol if you could just give us a little bit of a, a background um, in terms of a brief introduction, but just a little bit about yourself and your role from a governance perspective. Thanks, Carol. Thank you very much, uh, Caroline, and uh, very happy to be here with everyone. Um, as, uh, as you mentioned, Caroline, I have an experience in, in uh, financial services, and my latest passion has been governance as uh, you know, a board member, um, but also as the uh, member of the uh, Corporate Governance um, Committee at the MEDEF. The MEDEF is the French Business Association, um, and it uh, obviously is the trade association for all uh, or most of the companies in French, France from you know all sizes and I think it's important because as we speak of governance corporate governance it is often perceived to be you know um, rules uh, that uh, are established for um, the larger companies and uh, our belief is that it is very important that it is uh, common values that are uh, organization and values that are shared by all uh, corporations. Um, so if I may, I'll, I'll just uh, explain a little bit the role that MEDEF has played uh, in kind of, you know, uh, influencing uh, good corporate governance uh, in France over, you know, the last decades. Uh, obviously, uh, there is a very important uh, code, um, so best practices called AFEP MEDEF, um, and uh, I mean, in the name, you can see that uh, MEDEF as, as the um, business association was very involved in the inception of, of this code that was established in 1995, which seems like, you know, ancient history. Um, and we'll definitely talk more about the, the future, but it just shows that it's not something that is recent and it's, you know, been reviewed periodically. But um, I think for all our guests from around the world, um, something that is uh, critical um, today and, and, and foundational for all the French companies is a so-called Loi Pacte, P-A-C-T-E, um, which uh, was um, passed in, uh, in 2019 and has uh, really changed um, or, or is having a, a, fund a fundamental influence on uh, corporate governance in France. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll dig into that, uh, but I think it's, it's really important, as I was mentioning, that we think of co corporate 
governance, not only as constraints and rules, but also as a way of really supporting the performance of organizations and uh, that uh, these, these rules are there to support um, the, 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 the performance um, and, and the vision of the company. Um, the, um, the Loi Pact uh, that I just mentioned um, is also going much further. Uh, it's really rethinking the role that companies should play uh, in society. And I think you mentioned that André is an expert in ESG. I'm sure we'll have the opportunity of, of discussing how this, um, you know, the, this meshes together. Um, the Loi Pact uh, is, is, um, is clearly establishing um, that consideration of social and environmental issues should be incorporated in the company's strategies and activities and, and recommends different tools, uh, one of them being that companies of all size uh, really think about uh, their purpose or in French so-called raison d'être uh, and it's been, um, MEDEF obviously has been supportive uh, as a trade association uh, of, of um, uh, encouraging its members to, to think about the, their purpose. Um, some would argue that it's, you know, any company has a purpose just by, you know, it's any mission or product it develops. Um, but it is all, I think what is different and, and, and I'm sure we'll have the, the ability to discuss it is that it is not only looking at the key stakeholders as being the shareholder, but looking at all the stakeholders and engaging in a process with um, the, the, the key stakeholders, whether employees, clients, obviously uh, shareholders and investors, um, in order to write um, and, and, and establish what is you know, the mission of, of the organization and its purpose. Um, the, the law goes as far as you know, recommending uh, eventually to add this raison d'être in the bylaws of the organization uh, and uh, even uh, allows for um, uh, some of those companies to decide to become uh, société à mission, um, where you know it's um, it's the equivalent uh, for the of the B Corps, in, uh, if I can use this analogy, uh, in the United States. So I think what is critical in understanding this um, this trend is that clearly the world around us is 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 evolving. Whether you know we look at the various uh, crises. Um, climate or um, even you know, wars that are uh, going around us and none of the organizations and companies are really immune to that. And working on the purpose can be a very foundational exercise, obviously to engage internally and externally, but what is important as well is that the board and the governance has a key role to play in this. And uh, in the same way, you know, you define the strategy, it is something that should be established with great care and, um, and, and it's a complex and iterative process. I, I had the chance as you know, board member to work with two of my companies in this process. And uh, you know, it, is, it is definitely something where there is a lot of challenge uh, and where you know, it, the, the board has to be engaged and not just be you know, uh, uh, rubber stamping um, a, a proposal from management. Um, and, and also something that uh, clearly is currently is, is very important is around transparency. I mean, the fact of establishing a raison d'etre is something that is really funda foundational and, um, and should be done with care, as I was mentioning, but should be transparent and like everything should be measurable and hence the importance of um, establishing KPIs. I just wanted to, um, you know, 
to, to maybe finish on a, on a couple of, of words, and I know my, my other colleagues will deep, um, dig in, in further, uh, but it is important to realize that uh, obviously corporate governance is an evolving subject and that you know the French legislative framework, and I know Michelle will talk also how it fits within the European environment, um, is, is continuously evolving and, and our role at MEDEF is, is obviously to influence those trends and, and be part of it and, um, and educate and help our organization, whichever their size, to, um, to use uh, governance as a strong levy for performance. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. So purpose really seems to be kind of a, a top key factor in, in corporate governance in France at the moment, and especially with the board looking to emphasize the purpose as opposed to just signing off on it. It's very involved in crafting it. And, and did you also say that the ESG kind of factors need to be considered in purpose as well? Yes, because the purpose is, is generally, I mean, for those who really develop it in the spirit, has to be developed, you know, in, in conjunctions with the various shareholders. So each organization, you know, depending on its own um, structure, may formalize it in different shape or form, uh, but, you know, through different committees, uh, some, you know, some organizations have a very structured approach to the development of the raison d'etre. Uh, others, obviously, smaller size, but uh, generally engage, uh, but not only internally with you know management and and, and the employees, uh, but also uh, you know test um, externally with their other external key stakeholders whether you know, the raison d'etre in a way resonates and really reflects what they feel they are. So it, it's, it can be a very structuring uh, process. I think the drawback, and I'm sure someone will raise it, but let me raise it already now, is that um, it's hard to do and you can remain a little bit at the surface and a lot of uh, you know, criticism is like, it, it, it can be a little bit of greenwashing or self-serving. So uh, it's it's very it, this is why it's it's definitely not a marketing exercise, and it, it has to be genuine. It has it it is it is hard work. It, it and and uh, that's why um, uh, you know many companies have uh, engaged in this process but have not necessarily gone all the way as to uh, write it in their uh, bylaws because uh, you know because it is hard to write uh, it mm -hmm. has to mature and has to be tested um, so you know the law is pretty recent um, I'm sure in you know two or three years we'll, we'll be able to look back and, and, and look at trends and um, and how it's uh, it's, it's meeting uh, at least its um, its initial objectives. Thank you, Carol. Um, now I'd like to move on to Michelle. Um, Michelle, you've got a fantastic perspective in terms of the other directors' institutes across Europe and what's happening, you know, in their codes and, and their imperatives. But comparing that to to France, maybe you can just tell us a little bit about your involvement in governance and then just that kind of difference and that kind of perspective. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, in fact, first thing I, I want to say is that there has been a big change in corporate governance in France in the recent years. Uh, as usual in France, we have an abundant legislation. You will not be surprised. It started early. Uh, we had uh, laws from 2007, 2015, Loi PAC 2019, Rainforest in 2021, Loi RIC 5, I mean, for 2022. So there's an abundant uh, law system. We have a strong national code, AFEP MEDEF, as was explained, applying initially to listed companies, but more and more uh, uh, concerning uh, non-listed companies. We have specific rules, like the joint audit, which is a sort of French uh, specificity. We have single one-tier and two-tiers boards. In that sense, uh, we are probably a, a, a more 
advanced, if you want to consider it's positive, and certainly complete and complicated system. But it works. There is a great vigilance of interest of a French society. The employees and the trade unions, precisely because of their representation on boards, which is by law compulsory in large companies, and consultative in smaller ones. The political parties look at corporate governance. We have strong NGOs. We have strong investors, sometimes involving the state or state-owned entities. We have regions, city schools. So it's a system which is really under full scrutiny by anyone. The leading examples which I can use are gender and remuneration, and they are now combined in gender equality in remuneration, which means that you will need to inform on your policy and your targets on these matters, amongst others. What I would say is compared to uh, the other European countries, you should put the UK apart because the UK has all been, always been very advanced, but in the British way, which is not based on laws, not fundamentally based on laws, but more on practices, good practices or what best practices and the code or the codes which have evolved. But our system uh, is certainly now with, uh, with the Nordic countries, Holland, and now Spain emerging also, among the most advanced corporate governance rules and practices in the European Union. And it concerns all actors of a company. I, I will take uh, gender and remuneration as key examples. For gender, we started early with board members, and now it is extended to top executives, to executive committee, to top management, with targets which were very ambitious, 40% for one gender, minimum. And uh, now the new laws in, start from 30 and will reach 40. So it's really one of the very aggressive board representation concerning gender. For remuneration, it was initially applied to CEO level. Now it's been extended to top management, to all board members, executive or non-executive. It's also pushed towards employee share schemes to all staff and at minimum to graded staff. And it's extended not just on remuneration numbers, or information, but on the HR policy, which need to be presented and submitted to the AGM. In the same way, there are votes at the AGMs on ex boss and ex ante remuneration of the management, the CEOs, and the top management and the board members. So this is certainly a, a, a system where uh, transparency and information go together and are much more uh, demanding than in most other countries. So this gender and remuneration are interesting because now they were together. We look at gender equality in remuneration. It's a sort of combination of those two uh, mediatic issues, I would say. Now, more generally, and taking these examples, processes have been sophisticated. The implication of the board and its committees, remuneration committee with staff representation, don't forget, the boards of the listed companies or the big companies with also staff representation, mean that the board and the committees are implicated in any action not just once a year at the AGF, but all along the quarterly results and the ongoing information on internet sites, which is very much used. Take the example of the inclusion of ESG criteria in remuneration of executives. The code recommends 20% of the, uh, remuneration. 
and it will soon be extended to top management. And this is commented, this is presented at AGMs and all along the year on internet sites for any new information. The direct involvement of non-executive directors with the shareholders is something new in France, but it is now working rather well, I would say. And if, if it did not work, the shareholders would ask for it. We have road shows on governance, of course, the, the, the usual road shows on results and finance are, are there, obviously, but now you have specific road shows on governance. The chair of the remuneration of the governance committee or the vice chairman speak at the AGM in front of the room, directly representing, of course, the company. And there are communications all along the year with investors, with the relevant investors, and as, as there is no secrecy, or you should not have any secrecy, as soon as you communicate, you inform on your internet site, the whole community. There are specific dispositions on legal judiciary actions on bankruptcy, uh, which, which are very specific, but which bring specific uh, actions. Litigation, of course, is always possible but rather exceptional. But the full transparency of information and communication gives the possibility to all shareholders, including the activist shareholders, to intervene at AGMs. And we've seen recently in some cases that the whole strategy of the whole board was thrown out at the AGM. Well, of course, it's not the most common situation, but it proves but when the shareholders are not happy, they can apply immediately their unhappiness and transform it into action. So overall, I would say we've, we came from a situation of what we used to call the old boys network, who were trusting the board. I remember an article of the newspaper Le Monde, uh, probably 10 years ago, or even, yes, 10 years ago, publishing the names of all the board members of the 40 biggest companies and, and saying it's only men from the same school, same high administration levels, and they know themselves very well. So it's the old boys network. This has disappeared or is almost disappeared, has almost disappeared, and now, I think we are in a situation where the shareholders have their role, but all the relevant stakeholders, it was mentioned, the employees, for instance, and their trade unions, and all the stakeholders around are consulted. And it's, in fact, a, a sort of uh, obligation for the board members, executives and the non-executive, to ensure that the stakeholders' views have been taken into account. And then you have to communicate, obviously. So it means transparency, which has an advantage, but also a disadvantage. If you want to keep things secret, it's a bit more difficult. But the advantage is that you could say everything is on the table if you call the AGM the table. Thank you. Thank you, Michel. Uh, that's a fantastic overview. Really do appreciate it. And I think that the key differences that are coming through, of course, is the transparency um, and also the, the need for more of a compliance-based approach. Um, I, I was interested to hear that, you know, the, the British way, you said the British way, or well, maybe the Anglo-Saxon way, which is yeah. um, more, more than laws, it's kind of principles. But the French way is, is uh, founded on these um, compliance requirements, specifically disclosure and, and that gender diversity requirements. And very interestingly, um, you know, the trade union representations on boards. So I think, thank you very much, Michelle. And it's great that today we have Sophie online because Sophie is a, a lawyer that can speak to more of that. And Sophie, I know that you've got some slides that you'd just like to present and uh, display for us. Excellent. Thank you. I can see those. So I'm going to, to hand over to you at this point. Thanks, Sophie. 
Thank you, Caroline. Uh, so good afternoon, everybody. Um, so as Karen mentioned, I'm a, I'm a lawyer and I, uh, just by way of disclosure, uh, sometimes represent a big foreign investors, specifically foreign activists. That's the reason why I may have a dissenting view here on the panel, but I'm very happy to have my co-panelists with me so we can have a debate. And also I'm very happy to answer your question if you have at some point. I just wanted to take a step back and to explain why uh, we have some uh, French governance is a bit particular if you compare French governance, corporate governance compared to the UK or to the US. I think it comes from the fact that since World War II, uh, the French state is very, very uh, involved in the economy and has been a major shareholder. It's been already mentioned before. Well, and I think it's very important because there's always been this confusion uh, at, the, at the state level because, between the role of the states as, as a state, so pursuing a general, uh, in, uh, acting in the general interest, and also the, fact, and the, the role of the state as a state shareholders, which is normally to, to make sure that the, that, that the company uh, creates uh, as much as wealth as possible. And because of that, and because of the fact that uh, this French elite, which is so particular, when I explain to my foreign clients how the French elite works, is very. Imp I, I know that's a very important point because what you need to know is that a lot of large part of the French elite comes from uh, senior officials of the Minister of Finance. Michel tends to agree with me and say that it's a, it's an, it's an, it's an old world. I, I disagree. It's important to understand who sit at the boards uh, uh, among French listed companies, and you will see a lot of former public servants. And because of that, I strongly believe that we have a, a very strong uh, stakeholder approach, even before uh, the laws that Carol mentioned, which were enacted recently. Uh, and I think this is very important to understand where we come from. Uh, of, on, on, uh, during the last years, we, we have, uh, in, we have taken a move which is uh, more and more stakeholder, uh, uh, which has basically more and more embraced the stakeholder view. If, if I compare, for instance, we, we, with Japan, I take Japan as an example because I think it's very important to look at what's going on elsewhere in the world. Japan has taken a different route. Uh, Japan was very uh, much post-stakeholder over the last three decades and has recently taken a, a completely different move on a breast more shareholders approach because they realized that uh, their very strong stakeholder approach was an, uh, an impediment and, 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 and was an obstacle if they wanted uh, the Japanese company to, to, to have better corporate rules. If you look at the US, we know that they have a very strong uh, shareholders view. There is some discussion to take a more stakeholder approach but recently, if you look at some uh, research paper issued by Harvard Law School, you could see that eventually, even despite the COVID crisis, nothing has really changed. And, and it's more about discussion that, uh, that uh, act in practice. So we see there's a, a lot of things happening over the world. Uh, of course, uh, there's some uh, huge obstacle. I mean, the, the issue in terms of uh, distribution of wealth, uh, the externalities, the climate, the climate issues and so on. So there is this tendency to, to, to use corporate governance as a tool to address all the issues. Where I come from, we would take the view that it's dangerous uh, because uh, these strong stakeholder approaches can entail adverse consequence. And in France, uh, we, we see that, uh, we see that in different ways. What we see is uh, a lack of directors accountability. Uh, it's uh, always, I, I'm sure everybody is aware that you can read that uh, in various papers that the more you take a stakeholder approach, the more you enlarge the purpose of the company, the more you give uh, 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 power to uh, discretion to the management and also to the director to do whatever they want. Uh, the, 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 the more difficult it is to hold him uh, accountable. How can you challenge, uh, for instance, the former head of Danone, I think uh, everybody knows Emmanuel Faber, or, uh, how can you challenge him if, if he decides to invest, I say, like in Afghanistan, as opposed in France, when it comes to create a new, uh, a new factory? It's very difficult if it's only based on ECG metrics, it's very difficult uh, to challenge uh, uh, the management. And that's what we see in France. 
uh, I mean, and, and, and the, the consequence of which is there's no sympathy uh, for uh, minor shareholders when it comes to uh, uh, basically defend their views. So of course, I'm not saying that everything is bad. I recognize that there's been a lot of improvement over the last past years in the sense that nowadays, as Michelle has mentioned, shareholders activism has been more acceptable, recognized. Uh, uh, there's uh, efforts uh, which have been made to uh, create more uh, dialogue, to have a better dialogue between the board of directors and the shareholders. I still, there's still a lot of improvement to be made, but as I mentioned, the, the, the difficulty here is when this dialogue, dialogue doesn't work, it's extremely difficult uh, for shareholders to take legal action to make sure that at some point their right will be respected. And it's particularly when there's a, a huge uh, violation of duty or loyalty, and it can happen quite often in France. The reason why, if you look at some data, I'm happy to provide some data uh, after this uh, presentation, if you wish, you will see that when you look at who uh, own the, basically the, 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 the companies in France, you will see there's major controlling shareholders. We have an economy compared to uh, Germany, of course, compared to UK, to compared to even the US, if you leave aside the BlackRock also, which are passive investors, you will see that we still have a huge controlling shareholders, families and so on. And, 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 and that makes us different from typically the, 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 the UK, the UK jurisdictions in this respect. And if you look, if you, if you look at that and say, oh, so we can, we can draw into the conclusion that there's a premium, being the majority shareholders gives you a premium, otherwise controlling shareholders will diversify, diversify better the investments. And, and, and it's a really a sign that uh, corporate governance in France needs to be improved in order to better protect minority shareholders. There's another law which was implemented a couple of years ago before Loi Pact, which was mentioned by Carol, is Loi Florange. And, 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 and you should know that because of this law, automatically when you own shares more than two years, you get double voting rights. And there were some studies which have been uh, launched after that by researcher, French researcher, to, to, to see what were the consequences of enacting such type of rule. We see also this rule now being enacted in Italy. We saw that the, the shares of uh, foreign investment on French capital markets has actually decreased. So we have less foreign investors than before. So it's again a sign that there's this tendency in France to to be more French, to want the, the minister of France wants, we want our financial markets to be more French. Uh, sovereignty is uh, the new world and anti-globalization tendency is worrying to me. And I think we really need to, 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 to work to better, uh, to improve our financial market to make them more attractive uh, to, uh, to investors. And again, for that, we need to improve our judiciary system we need to improve our rules. Michelle said it's easy to litigate. Trust me, as a lawyer, I can tell you it's not easy at all. It's not even a question of class action that we do not have. It's not only the issue of class action, it's very difficult. I won't go into details about the case law that we, we, we have seen recently, but trust me, it's difficult. And I hope that uh, this uh, situation will improve in the future. That's a few words I wanted to say as a start. <laughs> I think we it's better after that to have a debate. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Sophie. And I think that gives us a, a very good understanding of, of the governance and the compliance approach and the difficulties, I guess, um, the, the positives and negatives of um, the compliance approach. So thank you very much, Sophie. I really appreciate it. Um, moving over then to Andre. Um, Andre is, uh, as I said, was involved in the um, development of ISO 37000, uh, which is the ISO standard for the governance of organizations. Um, it was recently adopted in on the 21st of September, published on the 21st of September last year. So it is uh, essentially hot off the press, so to speak. And um, it does take an approach that is um, more of a, it's not a compliance approach. It does bring in the principles. And it's interesting that um, Andre is, is the lead expert in representing France in this work. 
um, comes from the, the French context of compliance. So I'd really like Andre to give your perspective in terms of how these, these things work together. Um, and just a little bit more about yourself. Thank you. You're on mute. Sorry, Andre, you're on mute. You have to start again. <laughs> Okay, thank, thank you, Caroline. <laughs> Sorry for the mute. Uh, as, uh, as you mentioned, I mean, uh, okay, I have um, heading uh, an advisory firm that, uh, that which uh, specialize in governance and uh, compliance matters. And I'm very much uh, involved in um, financial institution license applications, for example, to operate and um, assist them to, uh, to increase the maturity of their organization and um, governing body practices. And uh, aligning uh, the strategy with the purpose, and we, we introduce actually this, uh, this idea, uh, can deliver a, a great value. And actually, um, my, what I'd like is um, maybe in the first place to, to put in perspective uh, the French situation and uh, definitely um, contribution from uh, Carol, Michel, Sophie, uh, absolutely uh, beautiful and uh, and very you, 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 useful because I mean the situation is uh, not as simple as uh, uh, it would seem. Um, and uh, so, in first place, put in perspective the current uh, French situation with respect to the uh, ISO um, 7000 standard providing a recommendation regarding the governance of organizations. And um, in the second place, I'd like to outline trends um, taking place. In the, in the French governance uh, practices. So as far as um, the situation, as you have heard, um, the Asset Medef governance code is a major landmark for listed company and mainly the SBF uh, 120. This positioning comes from uh, the fact that the Asset Medef code is the answer to the obligation of um, obligations stated in the commercial code, okay, Ask, asking for the, um, asking the supervisory body to report to the General Assembly meeting on governance practices and performance. Um, the High Committee on Corporate Governance has been installed uh, by the same code uh, in um, 2013 to first monitor the application of the code, second propose updates of the code, and considering changes in practices, and third, to prepare an annual report on its activities. So it's very important to, to understand that we have a framework, and this framework is capable of adjusting and evolving. It's very, very important to understand that. The regulator, I mean, the AMF, uh, rely on this uh, asset medef code, actually, to perform its own assessment of governance practices of listed company, uh, since the code is part of the law. The latest additions to this code are, I mean, the one I, I picked <laughs> for this conference, um, it's about long-term value creation, ESG integration, gender diversity, and Michel talked uh, in details about, about, and directors' compensations. Here's a snapshot. As far as the ISO standard is concerned, I'd like to, to introduce it briefly to you through its um, conceptual model. Uh, the ISO 37000 standard states that the purpose, purpose of an organization is a basement to build a good governance system. So in France, the PAC law enacted in uh, 2019 introduced a major opening for in saying that the purpose of a company cannot be exclusively financial and um, can also be the translation of its place of its positioning within the society. Then a good governance system relies on four uh, for national governance uh, principles. Um, what is the value to be created according to the purpose of the organization and how this value will be delivered? Second is how the strategy reflects 
the governing body's intentions regarding um, the organization's uh, achievement of the strategic outcome within the changing context, taking into the purpose, the value generation model, stakeholders, and not only shareholders. Third, I mean, the third principle is about oversight. Okay. The governing body should oversee the organization performance to ensure that it meets the governing body's intentions for and expectation of the organization, its ethical behavior and its compliance obligations. Fourth, the last foundational uh, principle is about accountability. The governing body should demonstrate, I mean, its accountability to the organization as the a war and holds to account those to perform, uh, those to whom it has de delegated. Uh, based on these foundational principles, enabling governance principles come into play to build a robust uh, governing system, which should deliver an ethical behavior, a responsible stewardship, and effective performance. So in this slide, I take a risk <laughs> because I try to compare and put side by side actually uh, the asset PDF code, which is this major landmark and this brand new um, uh, ISO standard relating to uh, corporate um, governance. Uh, beyond the mapping, um, what I would say in the first glance is, Asset MEDEF code is, um, is constituted as a rule book, okay? It's a uh, classical positioning is, uh, is value driven and the approach of stakeholders is according to me, okay, a bit narrow. Um, as opposed to the ISO 37,000 where this code applied to any organization is based on principles, I mentioned previously, is purpose-driven and um, take into account stakeholders in a very wide manner, okay? So here are the two main um, the key messages I'd like to pass, uh, to pass across. Now, uh, if I look at um, <clears throat> the current situation, um, I'd like to share with you, um, actually outcomes or, or extract from the latest report of the High Committee on Corporate Governance, um, reading the application of the AFEP BDF code. I mean, before moving further, you should know that the comply or explain principles apply to the governance domain when applying the AFEP BDF code. It's very, very important for companies. They have to explain or comply or explain. Um, in December 2020, all CEOs of French listed companies, uh, SBF uh, 120, have received a letter uh, from the, uh, the High Committee inviting them to improve their governance in few areas, such as gender diversity policy, rules regarding the proportions of independent directors. I'll let you go through this list. Uh, after presenting my perception of the current situation of governance practices in France, I'd like to start outlining some perspective and trends. And within the same report, uh, the Committee on Go Corporate Governance is uh, going to focus this year on a couple of topics such as sustainable governance, corporate social and environment responsibility, gender diversity in management bodies. So it gives you very good signal on where we go. If I have to summarize trends in governance in France, I will categorize those uh, trends in two categories. Trends relating to transparency, as Michel um, said, I mean, France is highly transparent, okay? And it's very, very important to understand that. <clears throat> Second category is trends relating to the expected behavior uh, of being a director. As far as uh, transparency is concerned, um, 
we we have successfully implemented the say on pay uh, from the transposition of a European directive. I mean, the SRD2, uh, promoting long-term shareholder engagement. And, and in line with this transparency mindset, uh, and in the midst of uh, the COVID situation and climate change, in uh, 2020, a couple of large companies, I mean, I mean, seats, um, I mean Total, uh, Vinci, Atos, have chosen to involve uh, shareholders in a consultative poll regarding climate. And this move has been triggered by active shareholders. So I, I may establish a link with, <laughs> with Sophie uh, intervention. We, have, we are all aware um, of the voting matters related report relating to ESG resolution in 2020. And a lot of, a lot re remains to be, to, be, to, to be done. Nonetheless, um, I bet that the tendency to integrate climate in the broad agenda is accelerating. In particular, because ESG is becoming um, a top of the board agenda. In line with the climate and the ESG topic, the CSRD, the European Corporate Sustainability Report Directive uh, proposal, has been published and comes together with the EU tax taxonomy to direct finance toward the European Green Deal. And all this should lead to texts redefining the responsibilities of directors and the purpose of company by introducing the notion of sustainability as well as the due diligence obligations imposed to them in their value chain. And it's a major impact for, uh, for companies. The regulatory pressure will force governing body to adapt and get prepared for this reporting. Relating to the topic of uh, gender diversity, um, I mean, this topic is, is, is very hot, as uh, Michel uh, introduced it. Um, the next law, I mean, uh, the new law, uh, the law Rixin, uh, can lead to penalties up to 1% of the turnover of the company. So it's a very, very strong incentive. Um, on the behavior side, uh, I've, noted, I've noted a growing interest in the fit and proper uh, requirement. By default, Directors are appointed on the basis of their competencies. And the <clears throat> Affect Medef code is adding a requirement about the number of mandates a director can accept. And there is also a general requirement, I mean, uh, from memory it should be 13, uh, dealing with the training of directors to understand the organization activity. Uh, for financial institutions, uh, the European Banking Authority released in July 2021, a final, gui a final guidance on, um, on fit and proper requirements. Uh, this is a very structured um, tool to assess the skill set and experience um, of board members. And I'm sure this document will disseminate as board are gearing up to become more professional. And it's a challenge today. The last trend I'd like to share with you is about independent directors. In, in, um, in France, I mean, the independent directors come back to the um, 20, uh, 2002 uh, with a Buttons report uh, where independent directors have been defined. And the Affect Medef code asked for 30% of independent directors. Uh, the Affect Medef code has also set out, I mean, eight, um, eight criteria um, to, to be examined uh, to assess the independence of directors. I mean, um, if I look at uh, those criteria, I mean, first one is um, employees, I mean, as a as a corporate officer during the previous five years being 
uh, an employee. Uh, second criteria is about uh, cross appointment, uh, not to be uh, not be an executive officer uh, of a company in which the company directly or indirectly holds a directorship. Uh, criteria three, uh, it's about a significant uh, business relationship. And uh, I like the definition of significant business relationship. It's not a conflict of interest, but it's something to articulate. Uh, not to be a customer, supplier, investment banker, commercial banker, or consultant. Okay. Uh, criteria four, it's about the family ties. And uh, Sophie mentioned actually, uh, yeah, that uh, there are few strong families in, uh, in large companies, but not all companies. Um, statutory auditor. Okay, you, sh you shouldn't have been an uh, auditor for uh, during the previous five years, uh, and the term of service shouldn't exceed twelve years. Okay, and last is a status of. Um, of non-executive non director and criterion eight, it's about uh, the status of major shareholders. I mean, um, okay. Um, independent uh, directors, I mean, play a great role uh, for introducing best practices within board. And uh, some of them are called reference directors. Mm -hmm. It's very important to, un to understand um, the attention that uh, the French are taking with respect to those uh, independent directors. Nonetheless, in order to prevent um, reputational attacks and the liability of directors, one can see emerging advisory committees in support of the board. And um, advisory committees from my standpoint, highlight the fact that too many boards have difficulty to get a 360 view of the organization and to embrace the required incoming information flow. So business intelligence processes could be useful, usefully uh, put, at, put at work. Furthermore, uh, most of the provided information uh, comes from uh, provided information to the governing body uh, comes from the organization itself, organizations they are supposed to oversee. So in today's uh, environment, um, characterized by a succession of crises, being in a position to capture at a very early stage indication of a change or risk is crucial. And the responsibility of a board or a director can be engaged is a, is a nice this, this piece of information. So collecting and processing the information is very is becoming um, a key success factor for a good governance. As far as the decision making is concerned, independent directors are also best placed to act as a as a mirror when fostering a decision. Today, one can see experiments involving AI. I mean, artificial intelligence. But one should bear in mind um, that in legal case, companies or board should be in a position to explain their decision and the underlying making process. This capability to audit the decision-making process requirement should also apply to artificial intelligence, of course, and um, artificial intelligence algorithm. Uh, and we are not yet. <laughs> We are not yet there. So, for example, uh, if I pick, I mean, uh, um, Ukraine crisis, because France is, is part of, uh, of this uh, of Europe, and um, so it's a good illustration of this situation. European boards must decide today, with respect to Russia and its government, should we say or quit Russia? What reliable information do we have? What business challenges can we face? What reputational risk do we have? So decision-making is for me the last trend we want, I wanted to share with you. Very, very important. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andre. Um, we are actually running out of time. I think you've had a brilliant overview. 
Um, but I, I think we've got time for one question. Um, and actually, I see that we've got a couple of questions on the um, on the chat, etc. So the one question was around um, the uh, representation of trade unions on boards. Um, that is a, a discussion and a debate in, in South African context at the moment. Um, but then the other question was around statutory auditors involvement in um, the audit of uh, assurance of non-financial information, which we know is just coming out of the uh, the CSRDs uh, in the EU and uh, the IFRS's um, International Sustainability Standards Board. But perhaps maybe just to, to land all of these presentations and, and discussions, just a question to Carol then. Um, so we have the ISO 37000 code, we have the um, AFIP MEDA <laughs> code, um, and I have that, that link actually is 2020. Um, the name was wrong, it was 2018. Thank you, Andre. And um, and then, of course, we've got all the compliance requirements. But, Carol, from your perspective, um, what boards uh, do you believe in general? Would boards in France look beyond the compliance aspects and look to the governance principles? Or do you think, in the main, they're driven by compliance, driven by the big stick? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think that's a very good question. I think we often talk about compliance um, and, and companies as one. Uh, I, and what I've learned from my own experience being both on listed and, and listed companies, controlled uh, companies, um, is that, I mean, the, the codes and the rules are often um, developed for the bigger uh, organizations. I mean, Godef, Medef is, is clearly, you know, the, the listed companies. My experience uh, over, I would say, the last few years is that the principles are starting to, um, so we're moving from compliance to, to principles at the smaller size organizations. And in many of the organizations I'm on the board of, um, are not, do not have to comply with the uh, code FF MEDEF. They're too small. They're just you know, not in scope. But from a reputational standpoint, I think André mentioned it earlier. I mean, if you want to be, I would say, a company of repute, you know, whether you're a regulated, uh, you, you are in a regulated field or you just want to impose to yourself because you feel that this is important uh, in terms of, uh, you know, your purpose and what you stand for as an organization. Many of um, the organization I'm in, I mean, they follow the generally the principles of the code FF MEDEF in particular, or, you know, Andre mentioned um, are will be very vigilant around conflict of interest. So I think there are different ways. Um, and it's really when a, a board and a manager to understand that it's not about compliance, uh, but also because it is good governance, it's good for the organization of, of the, the company, that it really starts making sense. And I want to give an example, I think Michelle mentioned, you know, the importance of the diversity rule. I mean, the, the diversity rule basically applies to the bigger organizations in France, but many, many more, you know, use the, those rules of, you know, having 40% um, uh, of women, for example, on the board as, as a guiding principle and uh, as a way of really not only bringing uh, sexual diversity, but also diversity of mindset. And uh, to a point that Sophie was making earlier, you know, saying that it's a little bit of a, sorry, gentlemen, an old boys club in, in some of the, you know, an old boy public servant club um, in, in many of the large uh, companies, um, th those rules, whether it is around diversity or the, the rules around fit and proper, where you need to, to be extremely, um, you know, I mean, knowledgeable from a technical standpoint to be able to, you know, be on, uh, accepted on the board of, of certain uh, organizations. I think those various elements combined do play into having a change of generation, a change of uh, mix in, in the boards. And, and the boards are becoming much more 
I would say professional. And, um, and, and so I think seeing probably, and I've spent a couple of years in the US and just having rules on the percentage of women on the board is something that is almost heretic um, and inconceivable. But I mean, this is the way France is established. It's the top down approach, uh, but uh, you, know, you shouldn't be just limited by those rules and understand that it does effectively change um, people's behavior, companies' behavior. So, and, and this is, I think, the message that I would like to, um, to, to share to our audience is that we have a framework, it's evolving, you know, some things are good, some things are, you know, can be improved, but I, I'm a firm believer that the recent steps have been game changers in terms of behavior, and when you start affecting behavior, you know you're on the right path. It's not, you know, the perfect magic tool, uh, but uh, but I'm seeing being on board myself, you know, some some evolutions and things that previously would have been kind of acceptable or not being discussed now are at least you know put on the table. I'll Thank close you very there. Much, sure, Carol. my colleagues Great. would like to. Yeah. We've actually run out of time. It, we're on the hour. So oh. Carol, thank you, Michelle, Sophie, Andre, thank you very much for your time. Really do appreciate it. And we've got so much uh, more to discuss. We've just run out of time today. I would have loved to have heard a little bit more about um, Sophie's uh, stance and uh, Michelle's stance, um, specifically in terms of the um, director remuneration um, and uh, you know, the, the shareholders uh, representation and independent directors, etc. But unfortunately, we've run out of time. Um, to Sophie's point, in fact, our next uh, governance around the world will happen on the 5th of May, and that's governance in Japan. And thereafter, we'll have on the 7th of June governance in Canada. And those will be opening shortly for registration. So um, follow the page, uh, join the community, and we look forward to seeing you on the next event. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.